So we are here to cross collaborate and discuss. Uh, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so yeah, so we actually have a couple more folks uh, slotted to join us here, but I have a feeling they will trickle in and we can, uh, they'll have to introduce themselves last. That's basically the story there. Um, so first thing we're gonna do is just do a quick round of introductions. So try to keep it brief, but we do want a good idea of the background um, that you're working with, just as a nice basis Hi, for our conversation. Hi, Neil. We're just about to do a round of introductions. Oh, so good, so I'll, I came I'll, at the right time. <laughs> yes, uh, I'll go first since I'm talking already. Um, I'm Marie Norden. I am Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator. I have been in this role since November of 2019. Previously to that, I contributed to the Fedora project mainly on badges and graphic design since 2013 when I started as an intern with Outreachy. Um, so that is my open source kind of story there. And I'm going to pass it to Matthew. I am Fedora project leader, and um, I've been involved in Fedora since forever. And mostly in Fedora, I've dabbled in some other Linux distributions, but none of them ever stuck. But, um, I, you know, I, I appreciate the that there, there's all the other options out there. So. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, Neil. What? Oh, uh, hi. Uh... My name's Neil Gompa. I've been doing this for over a decade and a half. I think actually if I, I counted this morning, just thinking about this in preparation, I think it's almost 18 years now of doing Linux in some form or fashion, uh, which is most of my life now. Um, and uh, I started with you know Red Hat Linux and uh, went from Red Hat Linux to Fedora Core and actually for a long time ran both Ubuntu and Fedora um, in parallel uh, and dabbled a little bit with SUSE, uh, Mandriva, Rip Mandriva, uh, and uh, Gen2, Arch, all kind of a little bit all over the place before coming back and really settling in uh, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Magia, Open Mandriva, uh, and, and kind of making those places my home for, for stuff and things. I don't know if that actually explained anything about what I do, but like, eh. Yes. Everything. You do everything, and that kind of explained it pretty well. Yeah, yeah. I'm in Fesco in Fedora, and I'm on the board for OpenSUSE. Um, I'm on the board and in the council in Magia. Um, and I don't know what I am in, in Open Mandriva. That's sort of a, a an open question, but whatever. That's fine. Ben, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Ben Cotton. I'm the Fedora program manager. Um, so sort of like the, the chief operations officer in terms of like, you know, getting releases uh, scheduled and out on time. And I also participate in some upstreams here and there, mostly as a liaison to, um, you know, from Fedora bugs up to the upstream. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Doug, do you want to go next? Sure. Yeah, I'm Douglas DeMaio. Um, so I, I work as sort of a community manager, marketing, PR, event coordinator uh, for OpenSUSE. We'll do a variety of different things. Um, and, and events is one of those as well. So like organizing, also like reaching out to other organizations for uh, the sponsorship of events and booths and swag and all that other stuff. So it's kind of Doug, I think you're I, the, the open Susa version of me. I think so. <laughs> you're the O cake. Okay, Dan's next. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan. I'm a software developer working for Susa. I've been using Linux for quite a while. Uh, I think I've mostly stuck with Fedora where I'm more or less active in my in my free time i recently got elected to fesco because neil nudged me thanks neil so yeah and besides that i well my day job is mostly coding but i've also done some qa where i've worked with the uh, SUSE qa department and uh, worked with open qa and also done some stuff with adam uh, on the fedora side 
yeah i guess that's that's mostly that's mostly it so right. i'm with that monica okay so i am monica ahens madden i am the ubuntu community representative so i work at Con Nonical, and I guess I'm kind of, I guess I'm like kind of the, the UK of sorts. Um, and I started out, I'm pretty new to open source. I got started as an Ubuntu Mate contributor last, uh, very early in 2020. And then I got more involved in community kind of onboarding and also event organizing. I love tea parties. That's how I met Ben, actually. Ali. And so what I do at Canonical is I work with our community governance, help, um, help contributors. Basically, if our, if there's something our community wants to get done, I connect them to the people and the resources that they need. And we do a lot of outreach and also a lot of cross project work. So that's what I do. Cool, thanks. We have one more person who may have to sneak his intro in once he's able to join, having some technical difficulties. Um, but until that happens, I think we can jump into some of the questions that we prepared, if I can find the right tab. You know how that is. Here we go. We can just wing it. <laughs> Went well last time. Well, that's true, right? <laughs> it okay. did. It well, having some kind of a format is going to help us. I'd say we try to, you know, in an hour, and it would be great to take some questions from um, the the audience. So feel free to drop your Q and A as we go along. Um, if it's relevant to what we're talking about right now, I'll try to sneak that question in as well. Um, so first, we can start with what cross collaboration currently takes place between the projects that are represented here. How did it come about? Maybe tell us a little bit about the successes or failures of those cross collaborative efforts. Yeah, I mean, I can I can certainly chime in on a few places. So I already mentioned OpenQA, which is uh, for those who are not not aware of that. That's a uh, that's an operating system testing framework that's been used and that's used extensively by SUSE and also by Fedora, which I would call uh, I think it's pretty pretty great success in terms of cross collaboration because it works. Uh, it, I mean, the system itself is operating system agnostic. So in theory, no one is stopping Microsoft from using it to test Windows. And uh, fun fact, there is actually there are actually tests for Windows on the OpenSUSE instance to test WSL. So there's even more potential for cross collaboration. So I think that's that's one of the examples where working together really uh, really is beneficial and where it, where it works out pretty well. Um, then on, and then I myself am also, uh, I'm also a packager for in OpenSUSE and in Fedora. And I'd say to a certain extent, we're collaborating quite well, but it really, it really depends on the actual ecosystem. So there's some parts of the packaging communities that are collaborating very well with each other. And then there are parts that don't talk to each other at all, or that used to talk to each other and stopped at some point and then diverged and never, never came back, which is kind of a pity because it means that uh, I have to essentially, I maintain certain packages in both distributions and I have to duplicate all my work. And I, and it's, and uh, I'd say a lot of the stuff is, is kind of arbitrary. It could be, it could be unified. There's not really, uh, there's not really a huge point in having, having certain differences. So it would be nice if those, uh, if we could come to terms on something, something common. Well, that, that kind of jumps off into, into uh, how this sort of happened for me. Like, uh, I originally started uh, a lot of the original projects where I was kind of creating cross-collaboration across um, distributions, in particular, like Fedora and OpenSUSE, was 
mostly out of frustration because uh, at work, you know, I have to develop things that work across a variety of distributions. And, you know, unfortunately, my deep understanding of how a Linux system works and how things are actually assembled from experience made me realize exactly how capricious and arbitrary some of it was. And unlike a lot of people, I had the gumption to like <laughs> rationalize the Delta. Uh, and so I, I, a good chunk of it was going back and forth between Fedora and OpenSUSE communities, figuring out where the differences are and trying to reunify them at some point. And like when new ecosystems were onboarded in particular, like Rust, for example, um, from the very beginning, uh, I ensured that there was uh, a, a tight connection across the ecosystems to make across the distributions to make sure that the ecosystem didn't fall apart and get fragmented. Uh, similarly, like with Perl, um, I am trying to do this with Python now to try to reunify things. The idea is that by by bringing making it collaborative, we can actually take what we learn from the different communities and make a better experience for everyone on all of them. And it makes it easier for the Linux platform itself to be supported by by third parties and by users and 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 other you know you know extended members of the community, um, you know, without too much pain and suffering, uh, because you know. They under they can understand from one and apply it to another and and things generally work and that that's been a big part of my focus and while there have been some failures here and there on the balance of things I think I've actually been relatively successful in, in pushing for uh, a degree of unification uh, across the board because I think people in to some extent are kind of exhausted at all the differences when they don't need to be there. And when you can prove that they're capricious differences, uh, then it, it, it's a lot easier to make the case for them to go away. And speaking Hi. of differences. Adam has oh. joined us probably from a phone. Yep, vertical video <laughs> syndrome, yep. Adam. <laughs> Welcome. Sorry you had trouble getting into the session. That's Glad all right, no problem. Would you like to do a short intro? Sure, hi, uh, I'm Adam Williamson. Um, I work on the Fedora QA team, um, and I work with most of these folks on OpenQA upstream or how it, or how it distribution. Awesome. Thanks for being here with us. So we're probably going to move to the next question, but before we do, I just wanted to make one more point about um, cross-collaboration that's happening successfully. Let's look at this session we've had here and at OpenSUSE conference. and. Um, the ability to bring more of our uh, contributors to like partnering conferences, right? So like in the past, maybe like Matthew or myself or someone would have gone to the OpenSUSE conference and Doug would have come to our conference. And that was might have been, you know, it. Obviously, there's there's um crossover with contributors, but we can bring a lot more people to the, the different events and promote that and actually more people can kind of see the cost collaboration happening. But I think that's a pretty cool side effect of being all virtual. So let's move to the next question. Uh, the messages of projects collaborating resonates with open source contributors. Why do you think this is the case and how can we use this resonance to increase collaboration? So I think, you know, it's basically the you know, the entire ethos of open source, right, is, you know, we're, we're sharing what we know and letting other people build on it and building off the work of other people. Um, so it, in a way, it seems very artificial to draw that boundary at, you know, a Linux distribution, especially when we share so many of the same upstreams and we are, you know, all participating in those upstreams. Like it's, um, it's just sort of natural that we would do that. Um, and one kind of cool example that I just happened to notice on our Twitter feed this morning is uh, somebody fixed the, I think it was the Arch Linux Bugzilla um, package uh, wasn't sending email after a Perl update and they looked at Fedora's RPM and said, oh, here's this patch that fixes it and they fixed it. And I think that's cool. And then, you know, there's, you know, it's kind of an answer to the second question a little bit too, uh, the previous question. I think we're a lot of times collaborating in ways that we don't even know because things are open and people can just go look and you don't have to necessarily ask 
um, you can just go look and see what other people have done and build on that. Matthew, did you want to jump in on this one? I I down on our cheat sheet for this that I had something to say, but I now I feel like Ben said the stuff I was gonna say, so I don't feel like maybe we didn't cheat sufficiently on, on that. I think it's I think it's true though the point that Ben made about like not knowing that it's necessarily happening. Like uh, so something we worked on in Fedora was a Fedora zine, right? And then I had some folks reach out to me on the side like. There's this French Wikipedia community that's making a zine uh, based off of the inspiration they got from the Fedoras, you know, like way different styles, way different everything. But they took that energy and that inspiration and, and created one for themselves, which is super cool. So I think Ben's answer, honestly, is the, is the answer. So I think we can move to the next one. Actually, let's take one from uh, the Q&A. An old school view of Linux distros is diametrically opposed from each other. What ways are there to better tell the stories of cross collaboration and how it in impacts innovation in each distro? Well, actually, since as someone who is like stuck his hand into almost all major Linux distributions, I even technically have some commits in Ubuntu and Debian, although uh, not very many, I do have them. Um, Diametric opposition in philosophy or in practice or in operation is not diametric opposition in operation. So like you have to untangle, you know, what aspects we're actually opposing each other. So for example, um, between OpenSUSE and Fedora, there are philosophical differences in how the distribution is ultimately structured. Uh, in sense of like how are packages collected and, and sorted, how are how are the mechanics of of the availability handled, um, what is the tooling that is used for it, and things like that. Those are not the same as uh, opposition into how is the software, you know, going to work. How is the software going to be um, necessarily completely delivered to the user? In a lot of cases, we generally do align in terms of like, this is the user experience that needs to be presented when the software is installed. This is the functionality that must be working. This is the functionality that in some cases must not be working. The number of times that we've had like sy synchronization conversations over like an upstream project has done something stupid. We have all tried to convince them to not do the stupid, but we failed. So now we need to, you know, coordinate on how to make sure the stupid doesn't reach our users. That has happened more times than I care to count. And that is, you know, something we all kind of share in common, like those kinds of things, we have a lot more in common than we do differently, I guess, is what I'm trying to point, get at. Like there are mechanics, there are some aspects and fine grained details that are differences, but the rest of it, like the broad strokes of it and a lot of what we do in practice winds up being very similar. Uh, and, and this is why, you know, to some extent Linux is Linux, but at the same time it's not because there are differences, but there's also so many commonalities along with those differences. Now, where you tend to stand on what you consider as important is where you pick a Linux distribution that you primarily use. So that's, that's kind of where I see these things going. It certainly doesn't stop me from talking to Gen2 folks, to Arch folks, to Debian folks, to SUSE folks, to Ubuntu folks, uh, to Fedora folks, to Red Hatters, uh, you know, to the endless folks, whoever, like, it doesn't stop that. Maybe the Googlers, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Does anyone else have a response to that? Okay, Ben, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, um, you know, I think, you know, there's sort of the obvious things like, yeah, we're all sharing most of the same upstreams um, and we can, you know, pointing that out. But, you know, I think about you know, specifically talking about the impact on innovation, like imagine how little innovation we'd be doing if we were all writing our same, you know, test frameworks and our same, you know, everybody had to write their own bug tracker and like all the sort of, you know, operational stuff that goes into, you know, the process around building, testing and shipping and distribution. 
um, you know, talking about the ways that we share some of that tooling or at least share some of the philosophy, even if we're using, you know, Launchpad versus Bugzilla versus, you know, GitLab or whatever, like a lot of the philosophy is the same. And so sharing that information with each other and doing it in a way where people see that we're sharing information. So, you know, having this session at Nest and at the OpenSUSE conference and, you know, if we did something like at a Ubuntu conference or at a like, distro agnostic conference and just getting people together and showing, hey, look, we're partnering in places where it makes sense. Um, I think then it starts yeah, making sense. Yeah, and I to want people. to say just um, I completely agree with both Neil and Ben that, and I think Neil had a great point that we have more in common than we have separating us. But when we get people kind of to cross over from maybe a little box that they put themselves in and just start talking with each other and sharing that experience that they have is that's where the innovation comes from is when you get that intense collaboration be between people and i think especially kind of talks like like this or even just having a culture of where these kind of activities are promoted will help drive that innovation forward no matter what we use. I really like the idea of going to a distro agnostic conference mm -hmm. as a group of us. I think that would be really cool and people would really enjoy that. So I don't know we'll have to keep that I mean, chat open. We have a few uh, we have a few community managers on this call. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Mm. So yeah, I mean, there used to there used to be such events like a decade ago. I mean, there's no reason <laughs> we couldn't have them again. We know hint, everyone hint, on this call nudge. is overworked already. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> but, oh, I know, I know. Uh, Just so wait. I I actually have a follow up for Monica. So there is a question that has a lot to do with what we're just talking about. So. How will Ubuntu start to help or collaborate with Fedora or OpenSUSE when one is RPM based and the other is dev based? But very glad either way to see a representative from Ubuntu here. Well, thank you. And I think that um, that even though yes, the packaging there is that that kind of gulf there. But I think some of the collaboration that we've done is more on the community side because even though we are different distros a lot of our contrib a lot of our contributors are contributing to multiple com communities and so a lot of the issues that our community are that we're facing we're not facing them by ourselves we might feel like we're the only distro going well how do we re-engage our community or how do we deal with you know with burnout or things and then as we start kind of talking to each other we realize that this isn't something unique to our community that this is something that is happening across Linux and open source because we're all a small group of people who have lives and jobs dealing with a global pandemic and other crises trying to do these things and so um actually been having some talks with people about well maybe how do we do some talks between distros on mental health and open source contribution which um, I think and those are things that it doesn't matter where we're coming from we can collaborate and I think be even stronger because then it's not we're not trying to do it by ourselves we can pull those those resources together. And then another thing we can do, regardless of what distro we use, is to advocate for Linux and free and open source software. That is, I mean, again, that's where we're, I think we are extremely strong together. And then it just, you know, get bring people in to it, especially people who are new, people who might not have feel welcome, be, before and just get them excited about it and then they can you know pick what distro they're going to use but I think that is you know we have that again that kind of not united front but kind of this more uniformly welcoming front then it then it makes for a better experience and so some of these collaborative things have already started to happen 
and I think especially it's it's where dealing more with the people than with the than with the te- technical aspects. But those Although, happen too. Those yeah. certainly right. happen too. We actually have a yeah, uh, like, question we can add on, and Neil, maybe you can have a part of this too. Sure. We focus a lot on tech software collabs. Mm-hmm. What other good examples outside of that type of teaming up? So, Monica, you were just talking a little bit about that. I feel like, Neil, you're going to talk more about the same. So yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, honestly, like, one of the one of the bigger things uh, – that we we wind up collaborating with um, across the board is really community practices. Um, so like something that I, I've made a point of during my time, uh, not during my time, I'm still a member of the Open Source Board right now, but since I've started my term at the Open Source Board was um, adopting some of the practices that I've seen in other communities like Fedora, uh, where we've got a, a, a way for people to see what we're doing and how we're doing it. And how to communicate and 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 communicate what the what stuff we're doing, be it technical or non-technical, and start to kind of adapt that practice for OpenSUSE. So, you know, we deployed a Pagger instance last year, and we're starting to use it this year. You know, cribbing a little bit of uh, about how the Fedora Council governs itself. We're using that for the OpenSUSE board to like make our our process for doing things a little bit more transparent. We have started doing um, public meetings. Um, although I somewhat kind of regret it because it's 7 a.m. my time every other Monday. But, you know, uh, we do the public meetings. And and the big part of that is we want to try to, you know, uh, pull in, you know, pull in some of the good practices to make people feel engaged and welcome and part of the community that they are shaping, even if they don't really realize it. And, you know, that's sort of the non-technical stuff. And I know this was a little bit about, you know, um, non-technical collabs. There was also, uh, I just wanted to also mention just a tiny bit of a joke answer because like uh, at the very beginning with the question, it's like, yeah, well, RPMs and devs are different. So like I backport packages from Fedora to Ubuntu for my job. Like I use RPM spec files and build packages for Ubuntu and Debian systems pretty much as part of my job. There is there are tools out there if honestly like I maintain one such tool if, if it was something that the archive format matters a lot less than people think. There if if we really really want to we can definitely collaborate even on a technical level and we do. You know, more seriously we share patches, we share practices, we share, you know, you know, research, we share all these sorts of things. Like as Ben said like some time ago like the the arch maintainers of, of the Bugzilla package, you know, found a bug, looked at our package, found that we fixed we fixed the bug, had sent it upstream, it just wasn't merged or released or whatever yet. So they just cherry picked the patch and put it on theirs. Like, you know, at the end of the day, what what is what is a deb or an RPM but a collection of build instructions and mechanisms and behaviors for um, building and shipping code. And those things can be translated from one format to another. So, and again, that's actually a total expression of people working together to try to give you a good experience with software and solutions for a free and open source platform, right? Like it it all kind of goes back to we're people trying to make something that people can use in a in line with our, our core principles of free software and a free community and free culture. Awesome. Thank you, Neil, for joining on to that. So we actually have a bunch more questions in the chat. So instead of going with our prearranged ones, I'm going to speak to the audience here and uh, ask the next question. Okay. Could there be a universal open data format for exchanging package info so that people could easily build package index analyzers, et cetera? Okay. Uh, Does that make yes. sense? It, 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 yeah, I understand what, what's actually being asked here. Um, yes and no. So the it, it is technically possible for us to create like some defined format that says, you know, these properties exist here and this is what they are and whatever. But I don't want to go too deep into technology here, but like there are still like differences in feature sets and availability 
that in order to make something like truly useful, we'd have to bring up all the package manager functionality to be in line with each other. Um, so for a while, uh, RPM wasn't as, uh, as featured as the Debian system. And now it's flipped. Like in order for something like that to truly be useful without having to understand the underlying systems, they would need to be in, in alignment at, to some level. And I don't know if that's ever gonna happen. It might, but um, really what it's gonna be is as long as the distribution package manager system is relatively standardized within itself, any tools you build can under, can can consume that information and do something useful with it. So maybe we can have a universal subset, but like if you want a truly rich, comprehensive set of information, I, I don't know. It, it would be technically quite difficult to do without getting the package manager teams to agree on feature sets that we would move forward with and rationalize. And I don't know how practical that is. So one place we might do this is in the source RPM or source, I'm sorry, not source, RPM, source get idea, which is um, basically uh, packaging at a higher level up and then takes automation from an exploded Git tree to create a disk Git repository and so on. So that could be done where if we agree on what goes in the source Git thing, the way that gets translated into an actual disk Git or whatever package could be done in a different way. Wow. I, I would also it, like it, to see us, for example, going from that to flat pack directly without an RPM intermediary um, because the, the shuffling around to build the RPMs that way is kind of annoying. Um, but I would like to have that same, like we're tracking this in Git as our thing rather than just pulling it from the upstream developers still valuable. Cool. So I think we can move to the next question. Um, I see Adam's joining us again. Welcome back. Sorry you're having a struggle, uh, but this one might actually be yeah. good for you. Here we got open QA seems like one place where we can share gating on packages. Is there a cross collaboration where we see core functionality tested for consistency in base support or package divisions? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, currently, the way we collaborate with OpenQA is more based around the tool. We don't really share any tests between Fedora and SUSE or any other distributions. Um, I think it it's an interesting idea. Um, it might potentially be the case that the, I believe there was talks before about GNOME potentially um, adopting OpenQA for some testing. Uh, which might be where this sort of thing could happen because it could be done upstream um, as things were landing in GNOME, they could be tested and then that sort of validation would naturally make its way to the downstreams. I think doing it between downstream distributions in the way the question seems to be suggesting might be tricky since we have different release schedules and we tend to be integrating things at different times. Um, so the way we use OpenQA in Fedora is we're sort of using it, the test target is Fedora. It's not any particular package in Fedora. The thing we're always thinking about is, um, does whatever thing we're testing cause Fedora to stop, to, to not meet the requirements we have for Fedora, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting idea, but it's not something we're doing right now. Uh, I'd be curious to hear what, the, uh, what other people have to think about it. So I think one, so I'm also not, not aware of OpenQA being directly used, at least not by Linux distributions, because at least how OpenQA works, it's more of a user simulator. So what generally OpenQA does for those that don't really know it or never heard of it is that you have, uh, you essentially describe what a user would see and let them click around and that makes it uh, that makes it relatively tricky so i imagine adam's uh, example of gnome adopting it that would mean that in, once you introduce any kind of branding or theming um, you are essentially screwed and you can't use it anymore but what open qa can uh, what, what open qa can do is for instance um, integration with the linux test framework that's used by the linux kernel itself 
And I think there are some companies that leverage OpenQA to test, uh, to test their boards. To, uh, so essentially ARM boards like the Raspberry Pi or something else. And uh, that could be, uh, so that's something where it definitely could be used, but I'd say for on a, on a general packaging level, I haven't really seen it. So those, those distributions that use OpenQA, uh, I don't think they, that I haven't seen any real collaboration in terms of tests, but it would be interesting to explore this idea, but I don't know if OpenQA is the perfect tool for this job. Maybe, maybe OpenQA plus something else or something else. Awesome. Does anyone else have uh, something to add for that one? I guess that's a no. Okay, we're gonna just jump back over to some of our pre-prepared questions because I think we kind of started to hit on that. So what are some of the barriers to collaboration and how can we break down those barriers? Collaboration is hard. It's hard, it's very hard within the project already. And it often feels like more work and just in general to work with somebody else to get something done than it is to do it yourself. And that's just when it's individuals. And so when you take a, a whole bunch of individuals who are already working hard to do that extra work of collaboration, and then you try to like, it's like two galaxies colliding level of complexity. Um, and so um, that, that it's, there's just even more work, even when we can see the benefits of being one combined super galaxy. Um, it, it, it's just a lot of work. Yeah, I'm really just taken with my metaphor now here, and I'm just going to go off on that for a while. <laughs> I think there's a lot of like personal identity problems too. Like, if you primarily identify as a contributor to the upstream project, maybe collaborating across distri different distributions you know, seems natural to you. If you primarily, like I am a Fedora contributor, I'm an OpenSUSE contributor, I'm a Ubuntu contributor, then you kind of see things in a different way and you're like, oh, well, I don't care about that distribution, I care about mine. And, you know, I think that's, you know, kind of natural for people in a lot of ways, but also I think we have to, you know, sort of reemphasize the point that contributing to Fedora is also contributing to all the other distributions um, because we're sharing this information, whether we in, whether we're doing it intentionally or just by, by being open. I, this is sort of not a, a kind of a side thing, but, but you know the, the time differences and the uh, geographical locations of people. Sometimes, for example, when we look at, at the uh, events, like we have the Open Source Asia Summit happening this weekend as well. You know, and it's like Neil's Neil's going to give it talk there and you're looking at time frames right like you know where you are in the world how how much it can contribute to um to some of these events where we'd like to sort of have more interactions i guess is this can be difficult oh my gosh for me for near we will send you coffee. Um, I think that, you know, echoing what Ben said is that you have the kind of that tribalism that, you know, um, it's like, um, especially for people who closely identify with contributing to one distro, um, that's, that's an issue. But I think also one of the things is um, going back to what Ben, Ben said, it's like, is that we're all doing so much work. We have our full, I mean, there's a few of us who are fortunate enough that that this is part of our jobs, but especially for people who are doing like, I mean, even for us, it's a challenge. So for people who are doing 40, 50 hour jobs at other places and then trying to do work here, I think it's trying to convince people of the benefits of collaboration because otherwise it just does seem like more work for the sake of work or for the sake of just some warm fuzzy feeling and it's like no it's not just it's there are clear tangible be benefits but I think if we 
don't frame it well or worse we collaborate badly and so we're getting together but we're not seeing those benefits then i think that's when that that can be a big hurdle yeah so one thing about collaboration things um we have to keep our marketing impulses and marketing departments in check a little bit on this because um, if we collaborate on something and then that results in a press release coming out of one organization saying look at all these awesome things that we did to make performance so much better in gnome it makes the people who worked on that um, feel hurt uh, that's a totally hypothetical example, right? Hypothetical yeah, absolutely yeah. not. It, it did not happen, right? Like that, that just did uh, not ever happen. Uh, uh, just thinking about how how I I've seen it, like specifically with work on OpenQA, I, I think like two of the practical issues can be uh, communication and consideration. So by consideration, I mean. Sometimes if I'm looking at a problem that we're having in OpenQA, like it's causing a problem with our deployment of it, and I'm thinking, you know, what can I do to fix it? I'm looking at it from the perspective of, I know this is how we use the system. And I know that making this change won't cause any problems for how we use it, but it can be more difficult for me to think, okay, how does another user, how does Suze use it? How does someone else use it? Is my change going to cause problems for them? Um, and I think a weird thing I noticed about this is that it's a problem that has a really good technical fix, which is tests. Like one thing I've really noticed with OpenQA lately, like when I first got involved with it, the test suite maybe wasn't the best and it didn't cover everything. And I think all of us, especially the SUS folks, have made like a concerted effort in the last couple of years to really extend the testing coverage to the point where it nearly hits everything that all of us do with OpenQA. So now I know if I make a change and it breaks how Suze uses OpenQA, it's probably going to show up in the test suite. And it's like, if a test fails, I don't just get mad. I'm like, okay, that means I didn't think about something. I fixed the failure in the test. It's probably not going to break anything for the other people. And now it's great. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of an interesting situation where a, a potentially complicated problem has a really good practical solution, which has worked out really well. And by communication, I just mean another thing I really appreciate with OpenQA is not just the formal communication in the sense of bug reports and so on is in the open and, you know, it's developed on a GitHub. So we all look there. The issues are reported there, pull requests are there. Even the sort of casual back check communication happens in a public channel, uh, like an IRC channel or matrix channel, which is really great because sometimes it can, especially within working within a company, it can be tempting to just kind of pull the casual, you know, water cooler conversations into some kind of internal channel where no one else ever sees them. And that can be an issue because then maybe you can see what happened in public, but you can't see the background to it, where that idea came from, why this thing is happening in the first place. Whereas when all that stuff is in public too, you get to see all of those things as well. Those are some good points. I like the part about um, the last point you made about being it sometimes being easier to chat. Like, I'll bring up Google Chat to talk to these dudes all the time. <laughs> well, some of it, you know, is just like banter throughout the day, but some of it could probably go out there. So I don't know. That's a that's an interesting point. Um, there's another question in the chat. I think we should get to. Um, is there a way for so many distros working and sharing ideas? to act as a liaison to cloud vendors and other big downstream users of our collective Linux platforms. Oh boy, nobody asks the simple questions, do they? <laughs> um, I, I, this, this is one of those things that gets kind of difficult because it crosses between technology and marketing. And when it crosses with marketing, everything gets very, very hard. Um, and but but there are definitely certain things that makes it uh, something that it would be worth it. So, like for example, when it is difficult for um, community uh, Linux platforms to be able to, you know, do work and support. Uh, you know, kind of the requirements that a cloud provider makes of them to 
be available there. Um, you know, it, having the assistance of another uh, big name or another community or multiple communities that makes it much more difficult to ignore. Like, I'll just kind of say it, it's collective bargaining, right? Like this is essentially the Linux community is doing collective bargaining to make it so that, you know, things are more equitable and more fair for us to be able to be on those platforms. Like, I know of a couple of examples. I know Matthew would have frowny faces if I said any of them kind of out loud. Um, but like, I know of a couple of examples where um, it has been extraordinarily difficult to the point that we've nearly not been able to do certain things. And in some cases we haven't been able to at all because um, cloud platforms, uh, uh, some cloud platforms just make it exorbitantly difficult to be able to have a fair footing and be on them to show our wares and make our platforms available to people where they want them. Uh, you know, it, some degree you, you need support from others to collectively say like, we're gonna pull the plug if you, or, or, do, or do something, you know, much stronger than that. If you're not gonna, you know, come down and, and work with us on a level that we can actually safely do it. Um, but again, this is all complicated by, you know, marketing and businessy type things that, you know, it makes it hard for, for these kinds of things to happen. I would personally love for, you know, for me to say like, hey, SUSE people, Red Hat people, uh, Canoniclers, can we, can we like powwow and like come back to the, to the, to the cloud people that are making our lives hard and say, hey, you know, this is, you know, we've, we've previously been doing this before. We realize this is kind of like not great. And we did, we, we don't want to keep doing this. And we want, and we want you to make this more fair for, for the open source community as a large, uh, at large, but I don't know, like it, this is one of those, it's one of those hard things that like really requires some kind of really willing to cut, you know, cut some, uh, you know, pull some political strings to make it happen. And, I just don't know where that's going to come from. It sounds a little rambly, but like, I don't have a solid answer for anybody for this. Yeah, a, a lot of this is hard because the cloud providers have a certain view of how things are going to work and they are expecting vendor to vendor relationships, not community relationships. Um, and, um, you know, even with you know, a lot of people at Amazon who get it, even with, you know, people at Microsoft who get it, um, you know, it's, it's just a different way of looking at things and it's hard. Um, you know. I think that ends up being easier for like Ubuntu because of their model of having, you know, one, one distro for both the community and the, the supported thing. It's harder for uh, OpenSUSE versus SUSE Linux and you know, Fedora versus Shrell on the, on those things because um, they've got in in those cases there's one thing that easily fits into the model and then something that they don't know how to work with. Yeah, and I would, it, we are kind of in a unique situation compared to some of the other um, distros that are represented here, but I will agree with Neil that it's not letting your marketing departments kind of take community initiatives and be like, ooh, customers. And you're just like, no, 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 stay back. So, and, but I think that this is, it's an extremely admirable goal, but agreed with everybody else that I'm not quite sure how we get All right, I think we kind of might have a consensus on that one. If anyone has ideas, put them in the chat. Um, so we have a little bit more time. If you have any questions, make sure to add them now so we could potentially get to them, but I will go with this one. Time zones are hard. Video calls are now in overabundance and we've been to one too many virtual conferences. It's not Nest though. Anyway, um, collaboration <laughs> can sometimes feel like a drag on innovation because of the required effort to communicate and synchronize with many different people. How do you overcome that feeling? We kind of touched on this a little bit. I think a big part of it is, I mean, 
yeah, being on video calls all the time really stinks on ice. But I think, you know, adding in a lot of the social element where it's, you know, especially if there's sort of like a common thing playing games together and stuff like that, uh, you know, that helps make it feel less like work, um, even if it's still staring at a bunch of people's uh, in rectangular boxes. Um, into the time zones part, particularly, I think trying to do your communication asynchronous, asynchronously whenever possible so that people who are in different time zones can participate on equal footing um, and giving people, you know, time. I think it might have been Justin that said this at uh, I think in a FOSDEM talk a couple of years ago, but, you know, wait 24 hours before you merge a pull request just so people have time to, you know, come in and make their own comments, um, you know, unless it's like super obvious trivial. If you, you happen to be in the same time zone as the person and you close it within 30 minutes, that shuts out, you know, the rest of the world basically from participating. Just to pick up on Ben's point, I think there's like a, an underlying thing there, not even don't merge the pull request quickly, but have pull requests is an important one. Like it would kind of means bake communication into the process. Don't if you someone is innovating away at their own desk just writing stuff and pushing it out then a way to avoid that is to just not allow it like again going back to open qa you really can't land anything in open qa without a pull request nobody can no i can't nobody at Zeus can everything goes through everything has to go to a pull request and someone has to sign off on it and you can't always do that with every project because they just don't have the scale but once you've reached a point where there are enough active contributors that you can do that i think the projects that do it come out better than the projects that still have you know one or two people who can just work away and nobody they never have to talk to anyone nobody reviews their work if you make everyone go through the process then you're going to get more communication and you won't have issues where some people have privileges that the other people don't yeah no, i just like to add more on a technical view that I myself try to try to force myself to do collaboration. If there's, uh, let, let's say that I would maintain, uh, I would maintain a package. And of course, initially it's far easier to say, Hey, I know this will fix a bug and uh, I can just throw out this patch and, uh, keep this, uh, keep this patch now in, in my niche. And that may that might be easier in the in the short term, but one but it definitely kills the whole point of the it, I mean it kills the point of collaboration, and then I lose all the benefits of uh, if I submit my fix upstream, a someone will take a look and will tell me, hey yeah this will break in case B that you didn't consider because well you didn't write the project, and uh, second. I'll lose on I'll, I'll lose out on all the testing that all the other people will do if I submit it upstream. And yeah, it's initially it's more work, but I think it's uh, it's definitely a net benefit in the long in the long run. And so if at some point I feel like yeah this will but now to send this pull request upstream I can just keep this patch, but then I know yeah, but you know once the divergences become really huge it will be a huge pain and uh, so usually the benefits outweigh this additional work so. oh um so i think that um i know this is going back to what ben i think uh, what ben said at first that having these kind of social events and i think especially at like the you know things like guadec where i i think i got to meet some of you possibly for the first time because that's kind of uh for some of us it's a very natural place to meet but also i think um just having these little you know like game nights or, or socials or things that we're doing where especially where we just need last year was really stressful this year is shaping up to be equally stressful and having things where we can kind of collectively blow off steam um and get to know each other as people are really good and also this is going to sound 
really kind of cliche for me but um yeah if you can have things where you know you you're having like food classes like oh my gosh like seeing like people do food classes together and tea tastings and coffee things and it's just getting together with people over food is really powerful we all love to do it in person if we can find ways to do it virtually you know to break bread then that's always nice too but i think finding different ways to socialize with each uh, with each other is and i think justin put you know it's um having a distro social hour that would be fantastic cool so i think we're almost Uh, there oh matthew go ahead uh, our, our fedora social hour is susa social hour half the time anyways so just come join us i did i came to one of your social hours and got to learn the history yeah. of beefy miracle so i think that was also the same time where we decided we were going to have the fpl show up uh for nest because that was also uh i think i was was that that one or that might have been the one where i did the unboxing of open a leap on it uh in there i forget which one was that but yeah, like all of us show up and do and just randomly take over. It's fine. <laughs> Reminds me of the candy swap. Yeah. yeah. I think that also was the one where we decided that the open you say box was a calzone. Yes. That, that was that was the one. Yeah. We look at our distro boxes. <laughs> so And and that's why Matthew asked that on the on Twitter about the Fedora Deluxe Distro box set thing because <laughs> I was like, I was so, I was unusually happy about unboxing uh, OpenSUSE Leap, even though I wasn't going to use what was included in it. <laughs> so we're almost to the end of our time. I wanted to add on one more thing about the whole how do you overcome the virtual fatigue. And I think I'm actually talking to myself right now, but take care of yourself. Um, take breaks. Don't work. 12 hours in a row, Neil, yes, I'm looking at you, definitely. (laughs) Um, You know, just this is not all to life. And on top of, you know, the virtual fatigue, like life outside of this has been difficult. I'm pretty sure I can say for everyone, we've all faced a numerous amounts of challenges, different ones, widely different ones, but um, we're all working through challenges. So make sure to take care of yourself. And on that note, I think we can say bye and thank you to everyone for joining us for the panel, for the panelists and the attendees and everyone who asked um, some awesome questions. So see you around Mest and uh, today's the last afternoon and I dropped the work adventure link too. <laughs> see ya. Thanks, Marie. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Marie. everyone. Thanks, everyone.